there an on off switch? Yeah, look. Oops. How about that? Does it? How about that? Pinsky, 
that I am I have been asked to read. And these are the opening remarks for a favorite poem project reading from Robert Pinsky, Poet Laureate of the United States. I welcome the readers and audience to this favorite poem project reading, an occasion celebrating the pleasure and vitality of poetry in this community and throughout the United States. Two ideas inspire the favorite poem project, one inward and one outward. The more inward notion is that people get a profound, deep-rooted comfort and excitement from saying a loved poem aloud. This sensation may have roots in our evolution as not only a social, but a cultural animal. That is, poetry may be among the first means we evolved to communicate not only with our companions, but with our descendants and ancestors. The other notion is that contrary to a widely accepted stereotype, many Americans are deeply attached to specific poems. Though we do not have the public, social, institutionalized place for poetry of other nations, there is a vital submerged life of poetry outside of any professional poetry microcosm. I think that the submerged quality may be related to the relative absence of a single folk culture on one side and of an aristocratic hereditary social class that considers arts like poetry part of its inheritance on the other side. In any case, the volume and intensity of response to the Favorite Poem Project do suggest that the stereotype is misleading. I wish you all a happy celebration, and I hope that everyone here will send a submission to the Favorite Poem Project. Robert Pinsky. There's actually three other people that I forgot to thank at the beginning of this program, and those are our featured speakers tonight. We have invited three local people who are well known within the community to kick off this event. And the first of those is Barbara Evans. She'll be doing the first reading. Marsha Dunn will be doing the second, and Sal Sandra Alcaster the third. After that, I'll be reading the names of the people in the order that they've signed up. So Barbara, you're on. I'm going to read from Robert Service tonight. He's one of my favorite poets. Um, and the things I like about his work is one, he has a sense of humor. Two, his poems have rhythm and melody and music to them, and they rhyme. If they don't rhyme, to me, they're not poetry. I particularly like the ones that are of the Yukon, and the one I'm going to read is The Cremation of Sam McGee. There are strange things done in the midnight sun by the men who moil for gold. The Arctic trails have their secret tales that would make your blood run cold. The northern lights have seen queer sights, but the queerest they ever did see was the night on the, on the marge of Lake LaMarge, I cremated Sam McGee. Now Sam McGee was from Tennessee, where the cotton blooms and blows. Why he left his home in the south to roam, round the pole, God only knows. He was always cold, but the land of gold seemed to hold him like a spell, though he'd often say in his homely way that he'd sooner live in hell. On a Christmas day, we were mushing our way over the Dawson Trail. Talk of your cold through the parka's fold, it stabbed like a driven nail. If our eyes we had closed, the lashes froze till sometimes we couldn't see. It wasn't much fun, but the only one to whimper was Sam McGee. And that very night as we lay packed tight in our robes beneath the snow, and the dogs were fed and the stars overhead were dancing heel and toe, he turned to me and Cap says he, I'll cash in on this trip, I guess, and if I do, I'm asking that you won't refuse my last request. Well, he seemed so low that I couldn't say no. Then he says with a sort of moan, it's the cursed cold and it's got right hold till I'm chilled clear through to the bone. Yet taint being dead, it's my awful dread of the icy grave that pains. So I want you to swear that foul or fair, you'll cremate my last remains. A pal's last thing is a need to heed, so I swore I would not fail. And we started on at the streak of dawn, but God, he looked ghastly pale. He crouched on the sleigh and he raved all day of his home in Tennessee. And before nightfall, a corpse was all that was left of Sam McGee. There wasn't a breath in that land of death, and I hurried, horror-driven, with a corpse half hid that I couldn't get rid because of a promise given. It was lashed to the sleigh, and it seemed to say, you may tax your brawn and brains, but you promise true, and it's up to you to cremate those last remains. Now a promise made is a debt unpaid, and the trail has its own stern code. In the days to come, though my lips were dumb, in my heart how I cursed the load. In the long, long night by the lone firelight, while the 
huskies round in a ring, howled out their woes to the homeless snows. Oh, God, how I loathed the thing. And every day that quiet clay seemed to heavy and heavier grow. And on I went, though the dogs were spent and the grubs was getting low. The trail was bad, and I felt half, half mad, <clears throat> but I swore I would not give in. And I'd often sing to the hateful thing, and it hearkened with a grin. Till I came to the marge of Lake Labarge, and a derelict there lay. It was jammed in the ice, and I saw in a trice it was called the Alice May. And I looked at it, and I thought a bit, and I looked at my frozen chum. Then here I said with a sudden cry, is my crematorium. Some planks I tore from the cabin floor, and I lit the boiler fire. Some coal I found that was laying around, and I heaped the fuel higher. The flames just soared, and the furnace roared such a blaze you seldom see. And I burrowed a hole in the glowing coal, and I stuffed in Sam McGee. Then I made a hike, for I didn't like to hear him sizzle so. And the heavens scowled, and the huskies howled, and the wind began to blow. It was icy cold, but the hot sweat rolled down my cheeks, and I don't know why. And the greasy smoke in an inky cloak was streaking down the sky. I do not know how long in the snow I wrestled with grisly fear. But the stars came out, and they danced about, ere again I ventured near. I was sick with dread, but I bravely said, I'll just take a peep inside. I guess he's cooked, and it's time I looked. Then the door I opened wide. And there sat Sam, looking cool and calm, in the heart of the furnace roar. And he wore a smile you could see a mile, and he said, Please close that door. It's fine in here, but I greatly fear you'll let in the cold and storm. Since I left Plum Tree down in Tennessee, it's the first time I've been warm. <laughs> there are strange things done in the midnight sun by the men who moil for gold. The Arctic trails have their secret tales that would make your blood run cold. The northern lights have seen queer sights, but the queerest they ever did see was that night on the marge of Lake LaBarge. I cremated Sam McGee. I chose this poem this evening because, um, although it's not a children's poem, it's one that I've used on the pea green boat on the radio. And someone who heard it, a good friend of mine, Peggy Meinholz, who's a puppeteer, made me a tea cozy using that poem. And she made it by hand, and she made it with love. And it has several of the characters in the poem. There's the cricket who's telling the story and the snow that's falling. There's the partying potatoes. And there's the airy Irish lady that makes potatoes dance. There's some more potatoes, musicians. So this is for you, Peggy. The Potatoes Dance by Vacha Lindsay. Down cellar, said the cricket. Down cellar, said the cricket. Down cellar, said the cricket. I saw a ball last night in honor of a lady, in honor of a lady, in honor of a lady whose wings were pearly white. The breath of bitter weather, the breath of bitter weather, the breath of bitter weather had smashed the cellar pane. We entertained a drift of leaves, we entertained a drift of leaves, we entertained a drift of leaves and then the snow and rain. But we were dressed for winter, but we were dressed for winter, but we were dressed for winter and loved to hear it blow in honor of the lady, in honor of the lady, in honor of the lady who makes potatoes grow. Our guest, the Irish lady, the tiny Irish lady, the airy Irish lady who makes potatoes grow. Potatoes were the waiters, potatoes were the waiters, potatoes were the waiters, potatoes were the band, for potatoes were the dancers kicking up the sand, kicking up the sand, kicking up the sand. Potatoes were the dancers kicking up the sand. Their legs were old burnt matches, their legs were old burnt matches, their legs were old burnt matches, their arms were just the same. They jigged and whirled and scrambled, Jigged and whirled and scrambled, jigged and whirled and scrambled in honor of the dame, the noble Irish lady who makes potatoes dance, the witty Irish lady, the saucy Irish lady, the laughing Irish lady who makes potatoes prance. There was just one sweet potato. He was golden brown and slim. The lady loved his dancing. The lady loved his dancing. The lady loved his dancing. She danced all night with him. She danced all night with him, alas, he wasn't Irish. So when she flew away, they threw him in the coal bin, and there he is today, where they cannot hear his sighs and his weeping for the lady 
the glorious Irish lady, the beauteous Irish lady who gives potatoes eyes. Thank you. Um, my primary work is as a poet and teaching poetry, and so this is really a hard thing to do, to pick a favorite poem makes you feel as though you're orphaning all of the other poems in the world, and I have so many favorites, um, but I've, this one has stayed with me for the last 20 years when I first came across it in a book called Rising Tides, and that's uh, an anthology of uh, American women poets of the 20th century. And the poem is called Pan to Place, a hymn or a praise poem, written by Lorreen Niedeker, many poets. She was, well, actually, I think many poets are very reclusive. She was extremely reclusive. She um, lived in a place called Black Hawk Island, which is right outside of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And Black Hawk Island is actually a peninsula. She lived in a cabin, very Thoreau-like person, actually, and her poems in some ways remind me of, of, of Thoreau, an area that floods every year, and so all the cabins are up on piers, and it gets very cold there, so I know that her life was a, a fairly Spartan Midwestern life, and I think in part I identify with that because I was born and raised Pennsylvania Dutch in Indiana, and so the words, this, isn't, this doesn't count as my poem. I just wanted to show you how Spartan her life was. Her mother's dying words to her were, it's a long day since last night. Give me space. I need floors. Wash the floors, Lorene. Wash clothes. Weed. And I understand that. I grew up in that kind of environment as well. My mother's dying words, maybe. Wash the floors. Weed. But the irony was um, she worked uh, for the uh, WPA for a period of time. She went to college, worked for WPA, and then um, worked for a radio station in Milwaukee and wanted just didn't want to live in the city, and so moved back to Black Hawk Island, where she lived the last 20 years of her life, and um, she lost her eyesight, and so ended up spending those last 20 years of her life cleaning the kitchen and washing the floors in the local hospital, and also writing these exquisite poems. I like the contrast between those two things. She was not um, Basil Bunting. People. Famous poets made pilgrimages to see her. Basil Bunting called her the most absolute poetess since Emily Dickinson. And uh, she, had, she was in correspondence with William Carlos Williams and Louis Sikorsky and, and so forth, so she was not totally out of the world of poetry. I have one little, my Lorene Niedeker story, uh, which I'm not particularly proud of what I did, but I know there are some gardeners here, so you, you might understand. Um, I wanted to write about her and so I was at the University of Michigan. I was coming back to uh, Montana. And so I thought, well, I'll, I'll make a detour and I'll go to Black Hawk Island. And so I did, and I spent a couple of days there. And I interviewed people, and I went to her cabin. Or actually, there were several cabins. And at the end of that time, I, um, this is the part that I'm not really too proud of, but she got back at me. Uh, I spent the whole afternoon at her grave. And it was spring, and it was just a beautiful time. And her, it's her family graveyard, and there was just a carpet of dog-tooth violets. I mean, millions of dog-tooth violets. And I really don't think you should go to someone's grave and take something away, <laughs> but there was something in me that just... Um, so I just dug up one tiny little dog-tooth violet, and I had this image that I was going to bring it home and plant it and propagate it, and I would have a bed, a Loreen Niedeker bed of dog-tooth violets. So I got it back to Montana, and it was really thriving. And I put it in the little cottage cheese container out in the perennial bed where I was going to plant it. And then I got a phone call. And I was going to let it acclimate itself. And I got a phone call, and I went in the house. And I came out, and this is the only time in the 20 years of our marriage that my husband decided to weed the perennial bed. And <laughs> I was horrified. <laughs> It's one little violet. No, it has it doesn't have a flower, but you know what violet leaves <laughs> look like. And so we got out, and friends arrived about this time, and there was this, what was about to go to the compost heap, all of these green you know, grasses, weeds, and so forth. We went through every single blade of grass. 
and the violet had completely disappeared <laughs> and was never seen again. And that just seemed perfect li for Loreen. So he's like, I want to be alone, thank you. <laughs> so the poem I'm going to read tonight is actually in a book that I, I had hoped that Barbara had brought from Fact and Fiction, but I know that she has over at Fact and Fiction. This is Joy Graham's um, anthology, uh, Earth Took of Earth, and the piece, uh, Peon to Place, is uh, an abridged ver version of it is in that book. I would love to be able to, I don't think you can, you can see too well. I, I wish we had some sort of overhead so that you could, she really uses the page as a canvas. And the thing that's so wonderful about her poetry, I think, is one, the sense of incredible presence, and the other is a sense of absence. So there's a real meditative space around her poem. This is, um, these are a series of sequences, five line sequences that are, she was strongly influenced by haiku, and so you'll, you'll see that, I think, in reading these. And when I refer to, this is um, also a hymn to her family. And so the, the, the he and the she are her parents. Pan to place, and the place was water. Fish, fowl, blood, Water lily mud, my life, in the leaves and on water, my mother and I born in swale and swamp and sworn to water. My father through marsh fog sculled down from high ground saw her face at the organ, bore the weight of lake water and the cold. He sained for carp to be sold that their daughter might go high on land to learn. Saw his wife turn, deaf, and away. She who knew boats and ropes no longer played. She helped him string out nets for tarring, and she could shoot. He was cruel to the man who stole his minnows by night and next day offered to sell them back. He brought in a sack of dandelion greens if no flood. No oranges, none at hand, no marsh marigolds where the water rose. He kept us afloat. I mourn her, not hearing canvas backs, their blast off rise from the water, not hearing sora rails sweet, spoon tapped water glass descending scale, teardrop tittle. Did she giggle as a girl? His skiff skimmed the coiled celery, now gone from these streams due to carp. He knew duckweed. Fall migrates toward mud lake bottom, knew what lay under leaf decay on pickerel reefs before summer hum to be counted on new leaves, new dead leaves. He could not, like water bugs, stride surface tension. He netted loneliness. As to his bright new car, my mother, her house next his, a bird, a hummingbird can't haul. Anchored here in the rise and sink of life, middle years nights he sat beside his shoes, rocking his chair, ropes not looped in the loop of her hair. I grew in green slide and slant of shore and shade, child time, wade through weeds, maples to swing from, peewee, glissando, slub, sublime, slime, song, grew riding the river, books at home pier, Shelley could steer as he read. I was a solitary plover, a pencil for a wing bone. From the secret notes I must tilt upon the pressure, execute and adjust. In a sea air rhythm we live by the urgent wave of the verse. Seven year molt for the solitary bird and so young. Seven years the one dress for town once a week, one for home, faded blue striped as she piped her cry. Dancing grounds, my people had none. Woodcock pad, backland, air around. Solemnity such as what flower to take to grandfather's graves unless water lilies. He who bowed his head to grass as he mowed, iris now grows on fill for the two and for him where they lie. How much less am I in the dark than they? Effort lay in us before religious. At Pond Bottom, all things move toward the light, except those that freely work down to ocean's black depths 
In us an impulse tests the unknown. River rising, flood now melt and leave home, return broom wet, naturally wet, under soak heavy rug, water bug patched, no snake in the house, where were they? She, who knew how to clean up after floods, he, who bailed boats, houses, water in douses with buckled floors. You with seawater running in your veins, sit down in water. Expect the long stem blue speed weld to renew itself. Oh, my floating life, do not save love for things. Throw things to the flood. Ruined by the flood, leave the new unbought, all one in the end, water. I possess the high word. The boy, my friend, played his violin in the great hall. On this stream, my moon night memory washed of hardships, maneuvers barges through the mouth of the river. They fished in beauty. It was not always so. In fishes, red mars, rising, rides the sloughs and sluices of my mind with the persons on the edge. Thank you. is early, the fourth slot. Uh, little apologetic argument in advance of my reading. Um, I was over to university for the first time in two years, approximately two years, and I was in the men's room and found a copy of the Kaiman on the floor and read about tonight's gathering, and uh, I said, okay, I'll go by there and listen to some readings. And then tonight I read it, reread it, and it caught my eye that I was, that I would be able to have the opportunity to read and that was about quarter of seven or so, and I happened to have my book in the car, so. Uh, please don't leave after my reading. There, I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of other great readings coming. Uh, I can't really say what the poem means to me. I'm sorry for the, I haven't given it a lot of thought. I haven't even re read it as of yet. Um, it's Nutting by William Wordsworth. Uh, simply, I like it because it's written by William Wordsworth. Um, it's a nature poem. It's about a person, in this case a young boy, as Wordsworth would say, sallying forth uh, in, into the forest to collect the uh, nuts that are hanging from the tree. Uh, and also, uh, for some reason, uh, I was separated from my daughter and have been for a very long time now, and I read poetry on cassettes to her and send it to her, and for some reason, this was the one adult poem that I picked to uh, send to her, and uh, she probably didn't understand understand it, but hopefully one day she will, or have an uh, appreciation for it. So, uh, as I said, it's Nutting by William Wordsworth. <clears throat> it seems a day, I speak of one from many singled out, one of those heavenly days that cannot die, when in eagerness of boyish hope I left our cottage threshold, sallowing forth with a huge wallet over my shoulder slung, a nutting crook in hand, and churn my steps towards some far distant wood, a figure quaint, tricked out in proud disguise of cast off weeds, which for that service had been husband, by exhortation of my frugal dame, motley accoutrement of power to smile at thorns and brakes and brambles, and in truth more ragged than need was over pathless rocks, through beds of matted fern and tangled thickets, forcing my way, I came to one dear nook, unvisited, where not a broken bower drooped with its withered leaves. Ungracious sign of devastation. But the hazels rose, tall and erect, with tempting clusters hung, a virgin scene. A little while I stood, breathing with such suppression of heart as joy delights in, and with wise restraint, voluptuous, fearless of arrival, eyed the banquet. Or beneath the trees I sat, among the flowers, and with the flowers I played, a tempter known to those who, after long and weary expectation, have been blessed with sudden happiness beyond all hope. Perhaps it was a bower beneath whose leaves 
the violets of five seasons reappear and fade unseen by any human eye. Where fairy water breaks do murmur on forever. And I saw the sparkling foam, and with my cheek on one of those green stones that, fleeced with moss under the shady trees, lie round me, scattered like a flock of sheep. I heard the murmur and the murmuring sound in that sweet mood when pleasure loves to pay tribute to ease. And oh, its joy secure, and of its joy secure, the heart luxuates with indifferent things, wasting its kindliness on stocks and stones and on the vacant air. Then I rose up and dragged to earth both branch and bower with crash and merciless ravage. And the shady nook of hazels and the green and mossy bower, deformed and sullied, patiently gave up their quiet being. And unless I now confound my present feelings with the past, err from the mutilated bower I churned, exalting, rich beyond the wealth of kings, I felt a sense of pain when I beheld the silent trees and saw their intruding sky. Then, dearest maiden, move along these shades in the gentleness of heart, with gentle hand touch, for there is a spirit in the woods. At any given time, I have different favorite poems, depending on what's going on in my life. And um, lately, I've been living with an amaryllis. If any of you have ever seen an amaryllis, you know they're hard to ignore. About a couple months ago, my friend Cheryl Nothi gave me a very, very large pot with what seemed to be sort of an average bulb in it. And now, it's this huge, flamboyant flower in what seems to be a very small pot. So it put me in mind of this poem of Dylan Thomas's. The force that through the green fuse drives the flower drives my green age. The blast that the roots of trees is my destroyer. And I am dumb to tell the crooked rose my youth is bent by the same wintry fever. The force that drives the water through the rocks drives my red blood. That dries the mouthing streams turns mine to wax. And I am dumb to mouth unto my veins how at the mountain spring the same mouth sucks. The hand that whirls the water in the pool stirs the quicksand. That ropes the blowing wind hauls my shroud sail. And I am dumb to tell the hanging man how of my clay is made the hangman's line. The lips of time leach to the fountainhead. Love drips and gathers, but the fallen blood shall calm her sores. And I am dumb to tell a weather's wind how time has ticked a heaven round the stars. And I am dumb to tell the lover's tomb how at my sheet goes the same crooked worm. I was thinking tonight about the um, uh, character on Star Trek who would often say he was a physician and he would say, I'm a doctor, not a magician, and I'm a pastor, not a poet, but I feel right at home because almost nobody wanted the front row here tonight, <laughs> so it feels like church to me. I want to read a poem tonight called The Touch of the Master's Hand, written by Myra Brooks Welch in 1954. And I don't really know that much about poetry, but the first time I heard this poem, it really captured my heart because it talks about how valuable people are to God and how God can take a person with um, regrets and broken dreams and hopelessness and with his touch, how he can change it. It's called The Touch of the Master's Hand. It was battered and scarred, and the auctioneer scarcely thought, thought it worth his while to waste much time on the old violin, but he held it up with a smile. What am I bid for this old violin? Who'll start the bidding for me? A dollar, a dollar, who'll make it two? Two dollars, who'll make it three? Three dollars once, three dollars twice, going but no. From the back of the room, a gray-haired man came forward and picked up the bow. And wiping the dust off the old violin and tightening up all the strings, 
He played a melody so pure and sweet, as sweet as angels sing. When the music ceased, the auctioneer, in a voice that was quiet and low, said, what am I bid for this old violin? And he held it up with the bow. A thousand, a thousand, who'll make it two? Two thousand, who'll make it three? Three thousand once, three thousand twice, going and gone, said he. The people cheered, but some of them said, we don't quite understand. What changes its worth, came the reply, the touch of the master's hand. And many a man with life out of tune and battered and scarred with sin is auctioned cheap to a thoughtless crowd, much like this old violin. A one night stand, a glass of wine, a game and he shuffles along. He's going once, he's going twice, he's going and almost gone. But the master comes and the thoughtless crowd never quite understand the worth of a soul and the change that is wrought by the touch of the master's hand. Oh, uh, at a real fortunate period in my life after I'd studied the Chinese language for about a year and a half, I was even more fortunate to be able to study Tang Dynasty poetry with a retired person in the Chinese tradition who was a uh, retired military person and also a scholar. And uh, the poem that I will recite Fighting poetry is not part of the Chinese tradition. It's not it's something that you hum to yourself or something that you read or you know or something like that. But uh, the uh, uh, poem that I read tonight is important to me, or that I recite is important to me because it was the first time I understood some of the visual aspects in terms of the arrangement of the characters and things like that. Now, another thing that may be even less important is in the Tang Dynasty, which would be about 800 in the Christian era, uh, there were five tones in the Chinese language, that in the official language of the royal era. And today there are five tones in the Cantonese language, but not in the national language. And I will recite it in Guoyu, which is the national language. It has four tones, only three of which relate to the other five tones. That's more than you needed to know, but <laughs> I've already told you that in, that the, in the Chinese tradition, poetry is not recited as a group. It's something that you come to know and you read. But uh, uh, to give you a, a, a one other background piece about the poem itself, in the Chinese tradition, you, at that point in time, and until most recently, you were never an official in your home country. You could never be a federal judge in Montana. If you were from Montana, you would be a federal <coughs> judge in Florida. Or you could never be uh, really even a, uh, a governor in the state in which you grew up. There was a national system of exams. And that you, you were always a long way from home if you were providing public service. Even county commissioners couldn't serve in their own county. Of course, they probably didn't need county commissioners in those days. So uh, this poem, uh, which that there are listed under a couple of different titles, but probably the best one is uh, On a Moonlit Night. There's a person who's probably an official a long way from home in a southern part of China. Uh, uh, and it's toward the end of the year. And he's lying on what we would think of as a cot, probably on a porch, and he sees some light on the ground. And he it makes him think of home where that might be thought where he's from. And uh, he raises his head and sees the moon, and he looks down, and it, it uh, makes him homesick or takes him home. So. Uh, and it would be impossible, as it was for me for about seven months, to come to, I think, an appreciation of the visual aspects of the characters and even the beauty in which the characters are presented. So uh, I'll recite that poem with a small effort at some uh, dramatic scale uh, in the Chinese language. The poem I chose is one that I was introduced to in high school in basic English class, and it sort of stuck with me through the years, and every couple years I'd come back and reread it. I even once wrote a variation on the poem. Uh, my poem was called Win the Time for Toast and Tea. And 
one of the things I like about the poem is that it makes allusion to several others. It's like getting several poems at once, plus a couple of plays and some Bible verses and uh, <laughs> a work on agriculture in ancient Greece. And the poem that I've chosen is The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock by T.S. Eliot. Due to the time constraints, I'll only read the first half of it. It deals with the character of Prufrock first contemplating a moment of crisis that he's trying to work up the courage to commit himself to. And the second half of the poem deals with the aftermath, and it's up to the reader to decide how he actually dealt with the crisis. This is The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock by T.S. Eliot. Let us go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky like a patient etherized upon a table. Let us go through certain half-deserted streets, the muttering retreats of restless nights in one-night cheap hotels and sawdust restaurants with oyster shells. Streets that follow like a tedious argument of insidious intent to lead you to an overwhelming question. Oh, do not ask, what is it? Let us go and make our visit. In the room, the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. The yellow fog that rubs its back upon the window panes, the yellow smoke that rubs its muzzle on the window panes, licked its tongue into the corners of the evening, lingered upon the pools that stand in drains, let fall upon its back the soot that falls from chimneys, slipped by the terrace, made a sudden leap, and seeing that it was a soft October night, curled once about the house and fell asleep. And indeed, there will be time for the yellow smoke that slides along the street, rubbing its back upon the window panes. There will be time. There will be time to prepare a face to meet the faces that you meet. There will be time to murder and create, and time for all the works and days of hands that lift and drop a question on your plate. Time for you, and time for me. And time yet for a hundred indecisions, and for a hundred visions and revisions, before the taking of a toast and tea. In the room the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. And indeed there will be time to wonder, do I dare, and do I dare? Time to turn back and descend the stair with a bald spot in the middle of my hair. They will say, how his hair is growing thin. My morning coat, my collar mounting firmly to the chin, my necktie rich and modest, but asserted with a simple pin. They will say, but how his arms and legs are thin. Do I dare disturb the universe? In a minute there is time for decisions and revisions which a minute will reverse. For I have known them all already, known them all, have known the evenings, mornings, afternoons, I have measured out my life in coffee spoons. I know the voices dying with a dying fall beneath the music from a farther room. So how shall I presume? And I have known the eyes already, known them all. The eyes that fix you in a formulated phrase. And when I am formulated, sprawling on a pen, when I am pinned and wriggling on the wall, then how should I begin to spit out all the butt ends of my days and ways? And how should I presume? And I have known the arms already, known them all, arms that are braceleted and white and bare, but in the lamplight downed with light brown hair. Is it perfume from a dress that makes me so digress? Arms that lie along a table or wrap about a shawl. And should I then presume? And how shall I begin? Thank you. Of uh, all the great American poets of this past century, I think the one who has the least reputation for the magnitude of his accomplishment is uh, probably Frank Joshua. And, uh, and the reasons for that are political, geographical, and personal. He was a legendarily cantankerous man. Um, but the poem I'm going to recite is one that I've been reading for about 20 years, and I think it was commemorated five or six years ago. And I've only given it publicly a, a few times. Uh, part of that had to do with the nature of the poem. But the circumstances of 
given that one has come up, and that the most significant was included as part of the Mueller brief, was explosives more than seven years ago, close to seven years ago. The circumstances are such that even though the words of the poem are still those written by a man in the 1940s to honor the memory of his first wife, there is an emotional resonance for me that comes back into it every time I return to this poem because of those times when I saw it. The poem has, there are three poems in Rexroth's canon that have the title Andre Rexroth. This is the third and the last of those poems. It has two parts, which are indicated in the text by the name of the place where the poem was composed, and I will just give those right here. Andre Rexroth, Mount Carmel. The years have gone. It is spring again. Mars and Saturn will soon come on, low in the west, in the dusk. Now the evening sunlight makes hazy girders over steep ravines like the waterfall. Winter birds from Oregon, robins and buried thrushes, feast on ripe quail from the drone reserve. The robins sing as the rents of ice fall. Your ashes were scattered in this place. Here I wrote you a farewell poem, and long ago another. A poem of peace and love, the latitude of the long spring evening wind. Now it is almost ten years since you came to this place. Once more the pussy willows that hum after the new year in this outlandish land are blooming. There are deer and raccoon tracks in the same place. A few new sandbars and cobble beds have been left where erosion has gone deep into the hills. The rounds of life are new. War and peace have passed like ghosts. The human race shrinks towards oblivion. A bittern calls from the same rushes where you first heard one on our first year in the West. Where I heard one again in the year of the Lord. Sing it with us now. My sorrow is so wide I cannot see across it. And so deep I shall never reach the bottom of it. The moon thinks you behave as though the King's River Canyon were filled with fine, warm, damp water. Saturn gleams through the thick light like a gold black eye. Nearby, Antares glows faintly without sun. Far overhead, stone shines darkly in the moonlight. Look out soon, where we lay in another full moon, first peered down into this canyon. Here we camped by still autumnal pools all one warm October. I baked you a bed for six weeks. Here you did your best painting. Innocent, wondering landscapes. Very few of them are left anywhere. You destroyed them in the terrible trouble that you had long since 
churning and falling leaves, in the wavering of innumerable bats from the cave, dipping over the odorous pools where the great trout browse the evening. Eighteen years have been ground to pieces in the beer of life. You are dead. With a thousand convicts, they have blown a highway through Horseshoe Bend. I wasn't really going to read tonight, but I was talking with my uh, wonderful daughter, who chose, unfortunately, not to come tonight, um, about the reading, and she says, well, are you going to read? And I said, well, I don't know. I don't think so. And she said, well, I, do you want to? And I said, well, yeah, actually I do, <laughs> when it comes down to it. And, and a poem came immediately to mind. Um, and so that, to me, was a sign that, yes, this is one that, that meant something to me. I didn't have to think very long about it. And the reason is, um, it, the poem is The Road Not Taken by um, Robert Frost. And um, the reason it came so quickly to mind is because it has such a special message for me or has meant so much to me. And I think that's what we're seeing tonight is how poetry really speaks to each of us in an individual way and in a, a very powerful way. Um, but this one also um, has meaning on two, two levels. Um, the first time I was introduced to this poem was as uh, probably a freshman or sophomore in high school, and our choral club um, sang this poem um, with, with the music or the text set to music by someone I'm not even sure who wrote the music um, to it. but. Um, but it afforded me an opportunity to um, get to know this poem in a wonderfully, wonderfully uh, powerful and moving way. And one of the reasons it came so strongly to mind is, is it reminds me of how wonderful um, music has been, how what a blessing it has been in my life, because not only have I been able to uh, be introduced to uh, tremendous poets and writers and composers and musicians, um, but it also has a, allowed me to um, develop wonderful, wonderful friendships um, through the years and has enriched my, my life in so many uh, bountiful ways. Um, so that, so on one level, this is a tribute to that um, um, very great blessing of being able to share uh, music with many, many people. Um, it also, has some meaning to me because I think it's very uh, symbolic of how my life has has been over the last 50 years. Um, that there, there have been many roads not taken and many roads taken, and um, what a journey for for that. Um, so anyway, the road not taken by Robert Frost. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both. And be one traveler, long I stood and looked down one as far as I could. 
to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other as just as fair and perhaps, in, and perhaps having the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear, though as for that the passing there had worn them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay, in leaves no step had trod in black. Oh, I kept the first for another day, yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence, two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Kenneth Patchen. It's called The Little Green Blackbird. It's a poem that I grew up with, and I um, guess in some ways it's inspired me a lot to um, write, and in my life it's just inspired me a lot. Um, it's a rather long poem, so I'll only be reading four of the seven parts. Um, I guess the reason I like it the most is because it's about as nonsensical as life. <laughs> it's called The Little Green Blackbird by Kenneth Patchen. Because the ground creature looked so sad, the little green blackbird watched a sunflower and a child swing and an old woman crying. So the tiger asked him if he'd seen the little green blackbird around anywhere. The tiger was there too, and also a tiger just in from the forest. Well, the little green blackbird also watched a willow tree's birth, and a winged crocodile, too. So then the lion asked him if he'd seen the little green blackbird around anywhere. You see, the lion was there, too, and also a huge bearded mouse that looked like a lion, but was really a flat brown fish too lazy to shave. In those days, only the most timid barbers took along their razors when they went in swimming. But the little green blackbird felt pretty good, and he got himself a cuckoo named Willie Watt, a baby b whale named Willie Watt, a big yellow hound dog, which everyone called Willie Watt, but whose, r whose name was r really Willie Watt. In those days, nobody minded. So the flea's sister asked him if he'd seen the little green blackbird around anywhere. The flea's wife was there, too, and also an uncle of the flea's cousin's sister, who was also Willie Watt's father. You see, in those days, nobody minded, and it was pretty nice. Part three, because his sister saw Shakespeare in the moon, the little green blackbird decided to study some history and geography. Now this meant going to places like Portugal and I more Gulibad. So he had some cards printed and handed them out. This of course started a war because the cards were printed in ink. And the little green blackbird arrived in Portugal not only without cards, but without a head or arms or legs or even a little toe. This might not have been so bad had he been feeling all right. And it was no better in I more Gully Reet either. In fact, it was just as sad, really. So much for history and geography, he reflected ruefully. But at least I'm a lot luckier than those poor unfortunates who still have heads left about, about excuse me, who still have heads left to think about what's going to happen to them. Part five. Because his friend claimed there weren't any, the little green blackbird ran on and on until he chanced to meet a little green blackbird. But the little green blackbird couldn't get his car to work, so he said, will you come to my house at seven? Mike and Ellie are there right now. However, if they don't show up, Joe Bill has promised to rub fresh mud into our shirts behind the new schoolhouse. And what will that cost us, asked the little green blackbird, adjusting his thumbs. Only 50 apiece, answered the little green blackbird. Besides, I'm not so sure I like your attitude. Obviously, you're drunk. Here, help me up. So the little green blackbird drove off down the road until he reached a bridge. 
Then, adjusting his cap and his thumbs, he said, What are you doing in that river? And the little green blackbird replied sharply, Waiting for Joe Bill's sister, that's what. She comes here every Tuesday to wash his shirt. But this is Tuesday, the little green blackbird snorted, pausing to adjust his parade hat, his honeybee striped hip length socks, his red, bright red paper wading boots, and his well worn thumbs. You must be drunker than I thought, and he drove into the lake. Part 7. Because growing a mustache was pretty tiring, the little green blackbird's father always said, A bear and a bee, and a bee in a bed, only on Boggleslough Island can one still get that good old fashioned white brown bread. This made a very deep impression on the little green blackbird, so he decided to forget the whole thing. But first he painted a stolen motorcycle on the sidewalk and sold it to a nearsighted policeman. By then, of course, the little green blackbird remembered that his father also did impressions of O.J. Excuse me. His remembered his father also did impressions of J. Greenstripe Whittier on freshly painted park benches. So he invited 1,900 rabbits over for dinner, and they each brought him a tin-plated goldfish, a handful of gloves, the drawing of a frosty breath, and one of those decks of newfangled playing cards the kind that bite people. Well, when it came time to go home, all 19,000 rabbits filed out in a pregnant silence that was broken only by the sound of their low-pitched voices raised in speech. Whereupon the father of the little green blackbird quietly said, it is our sentence to endure and our only crime that we are here to serve it. I'm going to break the rules a little bit. The poem I'd selected this evening has already been recited. So I'm going to take another selection that I wrote, which of course is against the rules, but I have special permission. I'm Eric's father. I used to be an engineer in town, but now I'm Eric Burgess's dad. <laughs> <laughs> and um, when I was thinking of a gift that I could give Eric or I could show our appreciation for what he stands for in our community, for our country, for our family in particular, and for me as his dad. I thought of writing a poem for him. I write poetry as a hobby. And um, I also thought about his trip to Nagano, Japan. This was written before he left for Nagano to win the gold medal. And um, I wanted to make a, a, a poem that was uh, specific and uh, that related to the Winter Games in Nagano. And I also commissioned a Japanese lady, Cisco Roberts, some of you maybe know her, <coughs> to translate the poem into Japanese so that I could give it as a gift to the Japanese people. And of course, when you extend a gift to someone, you're leading with your chin. Maybe they won't like the gift, or maybe they won't take the gift. But I can say that after Eric won the gold medal, uh, we were very popular with the Japanese people. We, mostly Eric, but I was following him. I'm the oldest living groupie, you know. And uh, they would read it back to me in Japanese so that I could hear the poem that I had written in Japanese. And in some respects, it was a gift from one American family to the Japanese family. And you know, we have sister cities in Japan and so forth, so that also entered into my thinking and having Cisco translate it for me. So I'll read it to you. It's titled, My Gratitude. I'm a grateful dad for what you've done, enhancing our lives with more than fun. In the rising sun, we watch you fly, while high-tech visions share years gone by. Slowly in time a passion you share for grace and courage in cold, still air. In winter sports, Olympians unite ages, culture, and locations tight. Alone in your thoughts, don't see a clash, 
between old and new, just make a splash upon the scene of an exciting sport, then take it higher with your next resort. In a faster, higher, braver game, no special effect or counterfeit fame will add to the thanks each one of us feels as you up the ante in the hand he deals. While cougars get nine to the end of time, you only get one. He dealt you in mine. Like an ancient empire's martial art, you mime the moves, then become a dart, shot from earth once drawn from my quiver. Your country watches. Will he deliver? A loss doesn't matter, or if you win gold. My heart's been granted, desires untold. Well, this is a poem by uh, John Macefield. <coughs> Macefield um, is a uh, particularly favorite poet of mine. He was um, uh, known for, uh, I think, most known for his um, uh, sea poems, poems of the sea. He's also, for many years, the uh, poet uh, laureate of uh, England. But this uh, poem uh, that I'm thinking of is uh, a poem that uh, raises quite a few questions about uh, the profundities of life, uh, issues of death and uh, uh, destruction and, and hope. And, and I think that's the uh, final message of the poem, is, is the hope that it gets. It's uh, called uh, The Passing Strains. Water and saltness held together to tread the dust and stand the weather. Let me try it again. Out of the earth to rest or range, perpetual in perpetual change, the unknown passing through the strange. Water and saltness held together to tread the dust and stand the weather and plow the field and stretch the tether. To pass the wine cup and be witty, water the sands and build a city, slaughter like devils and have pity, be red with rage and pale with lust, make beauty come, make peace, make trust, water and saltness mixed with dust. Drive over earth, swim under sea, fly in the eagle's secrecy, Guess where the hidden comets be. Know all the deathy seeds that still Queen Helen's beauty seizes will, and slay them even as they kill. Fashion an altar for a rood, defile the continent with blood, and watch a brother starve for food. Love like a madman, shaking blind until self is burnt into a kind possession of another mind. Brood upon beauty till the grace of beauty with a holy face brings peace into the bitter place. Prove in the lifeless granites, scan the stars for hope, for guide, for plan. Live as a woman or a man. Fasten to lover or to friend until the heartbreak at the end, the break of death that cannot mend. Then to lie useless, helpless, still, down in the earth, in dark, to feed the roots of grass or daffodil. Down in the earth, in dark, alone, a mockery of the ghost and bone, the strangeness passing the unknown. Oh, time will go by, that outlast clocks, dawn in the thorps will rouse the cocks, sunset be glory on the rocks. But it, the thing, will never heed, even the rootling from the seed thrusting to suck it for its need. Though moons decay and suns decline, 
how else should in this life of mine water and salt and sound of wine but in the darkest hour of night when even the foxes peer up sight the bar cock crows he feels the light so in this water mixed with dust the bar cock spirit crows from trust that death will change because it must for all things change. The darkness changes. The wandering spirits change their ranges. The corn is gathered to the granges. The corn is sown. It grows. The stars burn out. The darkness goes. The rhythms change. They do not close. They change. And we who pass like foam, like dust blown through the streets of Rome, change ever too. We have no home. Only a beauty, only a power, sad in the fruit, bright in the flower, endlessly erring for a hour, but gathering as we stray a sense of life so lovely and intense, it lingers when we wander hence that those who follow feel behind their backs when all before is blind our joy our rampart to the mind I have a poem by a Persian poet Hafez of Shiraz uh, excuse me I'm, I, Nice reading, anyways. Uh, with locks disheveled, flushed in a sweat of drunkenness. His shirt torn open, a song on his lips, wine cup in hand. With eyes looking for trouble, lips softly complaining. So at midnight last night, he came and sat at my pillow. He bent his head down. And in a voice full of sadness, he said, Oh, my old lover, are you asleep? What lover, being given such wine at midnight, would prove love's heretic, not worshiping wine? Don't scold us, ye Puritans, for drinking down to the dregs. This fate was dealt us in God's prime covenant. Whatever he poured into our tankard, we'll swallow, if it's the liquor of paradise or the wine that poisons. A laughing wine cup, a tangle of knotted hair, and let good resolutions like those of Hafez be shattered. And uh, the, the prime covenant uh, has something to do with that. The Persians believe that uh, God cut a deal with uh, man and the angels and for free will, and I'm pretty free willful, and I'm not an angel. But uh, this is kind of like it's a poetic license to enjoy pleasure, which is like a big part of poetry. I'm afraid I, uh, I thought that we were expected to read our own poems when I saw the announcement, but uh, Renee was kind enough <coughs> to say I could read one of mine, and Mr. Burgoose, of course, ran interference for me, so <laughs> I don't know that. Uh, I'll read a poem from my little booklet that that I wrote a few years ago. Uh, of poems of people that I've known since I've been in Montana for almost 50 years, and this is about one of my most fascinating colleagues that I met when I first came uh, to the university. <coughs> I call uh, the poem a grove called Kramer Pines. High up in the Bitterroot Valley, you remember in John Denver's song, there's a grove of trees called Kramer Pines. Please hear me, it won't be too long. Joseph Kramer had come from Lithuania in his 20s, still a young lad. After many a trying experience, wound up here, for which we're all glad. He taught botany at the U in Missoula in his fiery and colorful way, and many a forestry student can remember him to this day. 
Smokey Joe was the nickname they gave him. You can guess the reasons why. Though often enough he made them laugh, there were times they wanted to cry. Over the whole range of science and human affairs, with his old world scholarly way, they learned about plants, but much, much more, with his humor and passion, they say. But when speaking of a particular tree, Joe's lecture was worthy of note. He declared his concern for our own yellow pine. I can almost recite it by rote. Some call it bull pine or jack pine, he said, but its authentic technical name is Pinus ponderosa, he would state, and it's garnered a wee bit of fame. He rolled his R's for all they were worth when pronouncing that mouthful in class and said, if I'd had a daughter instead, ponderosa would be the name of that lass. As it comes to all, Smokey Joe passed away, his love for that tree undiminished. But Bob Steiner, his student, I, as colleague and friend, thought his story was really unfinished. His students were working throughout the West, many in federal employ, so the USFS really came through, their action a source of much joy. For if you happen to visit Montana, out of Darby, near Painted Rocks Lake, you may come across that lovely pine grove, a memorial for Joe Kramer's sake. Thank you.